Okay, welcome everyone, uh, especially those joining us at home and as well as those here in council chambers uh, this evening. We're here uh, really it, it's something that uh, the city manager and I had gone up to, to Washington to talk about progress on Plumtree Island. And uh, we got a very informative brief from uh, Andy uh, Kaufman of uh, Fish and Wildlife. And we talked about the, uh, the interface between the Fish and Wildlife Service out there and the Army Corps of Engineers. And Andy, you had expressed an interest in coming down, and we had expressed an interest in you coming down to talk to us. I uh, wanted all of council to hear it uh, directly as well as our citizens. So we, this is uh, going to be a work session that talks about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Army Corps of Engineers briefing on the comprehensive conservation planning process and the status of that on Plumtree Island National Wildlife Refuge. So uh, that's the subject. And Andy, if you'd like to start and start with uh, basically, it would probably be better if you just start with the introduction of yourself and Okay. Your fellow team members there. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Andy Hoffman. Uh, I'm the refuge manager for the Eastern Virginia Rivers National Wildlife Refuge Complex, which is a four refuge complex uh, on the western bay shores of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I manage over approximately 20,000 acres of habitat for migratory birds and other uh, species. Um, and with that, I'll probably, uh, I've been working for the Fish and Wildlife Service for approximately 13 years. Uh, uh, bouncing around as a temporary employee, gaining experience until he became a permanent employee uh, in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Uh, served as an assistant refuge manager there for approximately two years. Then served at a refuge in Tennessee, a big waterfowl refuge, for approximately four and a half years. Uh, then I went to Canaan Valley for approximately two and a half years in the mountains of West Virginia. Uh, and to where I'm in my present position as the complex project leader of Eastern Virginia Rivers, and I've been here for approximately three and a half years. So with that, I'll just jump right into the, the PowerPoint presentation to give you guys an overview and update of the process. So I'll start off with the uh, mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System, uh, which is to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, and where appropriate restoration of fish, wildlife and plant resources. Um, again, the responsibility is for America's trust resources. That is our priority um, when it comes to managing the lands within the refuge system. A lot of people don't realize wildlife comes first on refuges. So, so the comprehensive conservation planning process. What is, it? what is a CCP and why is it important? Uh, comprehensive conservation plan is a strategic plan that uh, reviews all the programs within the refuge um, and develops a vision for management over the next 15 year period once the plan is complete. Uh, it fulfills laws uh, passed by Congress as well as uh, fulfills uh, service policies and helps achieve the agency mission as well as the purposes for which the refuge was established. Uh, we define the broad goals and specific objectives that we'd like to achieve in the comprehensive plan, as well as strategies that'll help us achieve uh, those overall goals and objectives. We address key issues that are identified not only by the service, other agencies such as the Army Corps of Engineers, DEQ, uh, and uh, the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, uh, just to name a few, as well as some of our local and local partners and communities. Uh, we encourage public involvement during this process, and there's two specific times during the planning process where the public and our partners can get engaged. Um, and it also provides continuity for the refuge management plan um, over, over a long period of time when there's changes in uh, uh, staffing. So, Part of the refuge planning, when we're developing a plan, it's, we got to be sure that the draft plan uh, fulfills the, the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is working with others to enhance, protect, and conserve natural resources for the continuing benefit of the American people, as well as the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System, which I identified in slide one, 
and then the purposes for which the refuges are established. Uh, we also have to look at national goals and priorities as well as the, uh, the entire ecosystem, not just a localized effort. Um, it, the plan, we've already gone through the phase of developing a draft vision uh, as well as broad goals that we've been working from and we're currently in the objective strategies in developing the draft plan and NEPA document phases. Which this is our planning wheel here and you can see uh, back in sep September of 2012 is when we began our scoping process and engaged the public as well as our partners. So Plumtree Island National Wildlife Refuge, as I mentioned, is a four refuge complex that's spread over the western bay shores of the uh, Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. Um, approximately 20,000 acres. Our headquarters office is up in Warsaw. Uh, where pr the majority of the refuge staff is stationed at. Uh, we do have one, per uh, one staff person stationed down at Harrison Lake Fish Hatchery, which is uh, right around Presque and James Rivers National Wildlife Refuge in Chester County. Uh, P Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge, as m I'm sure everyone here knows, it's adjacent to the city of Pocosin, and it's the largest contiguous salt marsh in the lower portion of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, not only is it the, the largest salt marsh, it's also um, the midpoint along the Atlantic Flyway for migratory birds. So give you a, a little background on some of the historic land uses uh, of the lands within and around the refuge. There is evidence of Virginia Indian presence uh, that dates back from the Paleo-Indian period in 9500 9, BC. There's also uh, uh, logs in uh, Captain John Smith's diaries of uh, the time at his voyages when he was doing English settlement and exploring the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the property was acquired by the Department of Defense back in 1917 for use as a bombing range for military exercises uh, and was used as such until 1959. Um, and there was some uh, identification back in 1958 where uh, three, three children were out there playing with the bombs and, and got injured. Um, so the, the 3,200 acre uh, area, former bombing range, was established as a National Wildlife Refuge on April 24, 1972 through the GSA Transfer Authority, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Act of 1956, and the Migratory Bird Conservation Act and primarily for use as an inviolate sanctuary or for any other management purpose for migratory birds and any other use that the Fish and Wildlife Service deems necessary. Um, some more of the recent history. Um, the service views the wetlands uh, and of this salt marsh as important, scarce, and vulnerable uh, throughout the entire northeastern United States. Um, uh, the Corps of Engineers has completed some work that was identified uh, that that identified the former bombing range uh, was eligible for cleanup. Um, the service went through a, a boundary expansion in 1993, which uh, expanded the acquisition boundary of the refuge by approximately 2,100 acres. And since that expansion only approximately 225 acres have been acquired at this point in time beyond the former bombing range. Um, and the, the 211 acres known as Cow Island uh, is open to waterfowl hunting. Uh, unexploded ordnance was discovered in 2004 and the Army Corps of Engineers des designated temporary danger zone on the waters to protect the public health and safety. Today, the refuge is in total approximately 3,500 acres in size, and uh, the additional 2,100 acres is yet to be acquired. This just gives you an idea of, of the refuge acquisition boundary, both in green and the stripe there on the map, and the area in green is what's current and currently in ownership through fee title that the service manages. So uh, just take a minute to, to look at the, the draft vision statement that has been developed. 
Uh, Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge encompasses the largest contiguous salt marsh ecosystem in the lower Chesapeake Bay. Located along the Atlantic Flyway, the refuge offers a diverse salt marshes, tidal streams, and long wooded ridges that support millions of waterfowl, marsh wading birds, and shorebirds throughout the year. The sandy beaches offer secluded habitat for breeding and nesting wildlife, including the federally threatened northeastern beach tiger beetle. Uh, the refuge offers rare opportunity for Hampton Roads area residents and visitors to safely enjoy expansive views of abundant wildlife thriving in these important, vulnerable, and scarce salt marshes. In partnership with others, the refuge's wildlife habitats support the rich traditions of hunting, fishing, and boating in the Chesapeake Bay. This was the draft vision statement that um, the core planning team had developed um, prior to going out to scoping and what we saw as the potential future vision for Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge. And Andy, if you, if you could, as you continue to focus, I really want to focus on the second paragraph of that draft vision statement. Okay. Okay, the, the rare opportunity for Hampton Roads residents and visitors to, to safely ex enjoy expansive views. That's basically why we've, we've asked you here. We've, we've seen your draft vision, and one of the things, just so that we're talking to the public, in earnest and that we're, we're talking openly. Uh, one of the reasons that we've all been gathered and, and in this uh, conversation is to gain access, some limited form of access to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that as you, as you go forward, you, you kind of talk about the planning process and how I, I think most people in Pocosin are familiar with the wildlife refuge, if not all. Um, the history and all that sort of thing. That's great uh, information, but really want to talk about the future and how we establish that second part of the draft vision statement. Okay. Well, um, uh, as you know, we went through public scoping where we uh, provided an overview of the refuge and some of the history. And during that time, the public had the opportunity to comment with some of their interest and concerns for the use of Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge and how it supports the city of Pocosin. Um, all of the thoughtful comments that have been received, we're in the process right now of <coughs> going through those comments and considering opportunities that may exist within Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we have a wildlife first mission. Our responsibility is for the trust resources first and foremost and when there are opportunities to provide opportunities for um, public access that support the the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System and the big six priority public uses we try to provide those opportunities for the public and you'll see that in a slide later uh, that talks about the big six um, so general habitat you know, majority is uh, emergent wetlands. Some of the wildlife, again, you know, it's uh, an important area for foraging, breeding, and wintering for waterfowl, uh, black ducks, northern harrier, as well as sharp tailed sparrows. We have very limited information about Plum Tree Island at this point in time, and that's, you know, a challenge that we do face is uh, because of some of the access issues just for general staff um, to complete inventory and monitoring. There's not a lot of information at this point in time. So this is based on my understanding, very limited surveys, basically two times out there on the refuge that they uh, identified these species. Uh, this gives you an idea of uh, sea level rise that's projected. This is where we are now and it's transitioning out to 2100. Majority of the uh, Plum Trial and Refuge is looking like it'll be underwater if the, the models hold true. Um, at this point in time for public access we do allow waterfowl hunting on Cow Island which is outside the former military bombing range with uh, we have six blind sites that are uh, offered through a lottery hunt system and is permitted by the refuge. How do, how do people get access to those? You, the, you say the lottery system. Yeah, how, do there's, they, um, how do they go about that? The state has uh, their cyber data application system for hunts. So they would go on there, follow the process to uh, uh, put their name in the hat, so to speak, for uh, one of the 
six spots that are available on Cow Island. If their name's selected for the dates that are available, um, then they have the opportunity to go out there and hunt one of those one of those blinds. So, how long have those blinds been up? It's something that we typically have to go back and do on an annual basis due to the harsh right, but conditions. But this system has been for how long? Mm, probably, well, roughly 10 years, I'm going to say. It was when, when they, shortly after they acquired Cow Island. Okay. Um, so we also have existing partnerships where we're working with the National Park Service uh, for the Captain John Smith National Historic Trail. Uh, to, to showcase Captain John Smith's voyages and tell the <coughs> stories of the past, as well as how that ties into the natural resources of the area. <coughs> We're already working with them uh, near Preskill National Wildlife Refuge, as well as Rappahannock and James River. Um, and then the Chesapeake Bay Water Trails and Gateways Network. These are some of the issues that need to be addressed during this process that we're currently working on right now. Their landscape and scale, uh, you know, we've got to look at things like climate change and sea level rise. Uh, land management issues, you know, sh should we restore things? How should we manage the lands? Is restoration appropriate? Um, how can we get better data than we already have, especially since it's very limited at this point in time? And then, of course, the public use programs, which would range in uh, range or quality of the program. We want to try and provide the most uh, beneficial quality program possible. Um, and uh, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, we have the big six priority public uses, which are uh, part of the National Wildlife Refuge System Improvement Act of 1997. Um, identifies these big six uses, hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, photography, etc. cetera. Um, as uh, wildlife dependent activities um, that help support the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System as well as the purposes which each refuge was established for. They're already deemed appropriate, um, but they do still have to go through compatibility determination to see, to ensure that we're not detracting from the purposes of that refuge. Um, all secondary uses would also have, uh, secondary uses would have to go through something in addition, which is called appropriate use, uh, or appropriate use policy uh, checklist to make sure that um, first, <coughs> if it's even appropriate to have that type of a use offered at a National Wildlife Refuge, and then it would also have to go through compatibility determination to see if there are ways that we can accommodate that use. How long do those processes take? It varies. It, it varies. Um, What's your mean? Well, right now we're in the middle of a, a, the planning process, so it's all going to be folded into that at this point in time. Um, if they were done outside of that, depending on the type of use that was suggested and you know how much we know about it, the fact that we have limited information on the resources on the refuge, that creates additional challenges as well. So I, it's really hard for me to all give right. you an accurate... So if it was a... a I understand exactly what you're saying, but if you went back here to some of your other refuges, what would it take? Uh, let's say that you went to Cow Island, that that doesn't have that those same barriers in place. Okay. What what would this process normally take a public use program? Mm. For one one use in particular, you know, I mean, I'm just taking a. Uh, a guess at this. I mean, it would probably be roughly, you know, maybe a year, okay. depending on the use. So, okay. um, and then if there it also, if there is uh, biological data that needs to be obtained, that might make it take longer. So we have the baseline information. <coughs> um, let's see here. So other issues to address: facilities and infrastructure and the limited staffing. Um, you know, we have eight full-time permanent staff members for four refuge complex, and we're pretty spread out. So there's things that we need to take into consideration when uh, going through this planning process uh, to develop objectives and realistic goals and strategies that we can achieve. Um, we also want to make sure that we're an asset to, to the local community. Um, 
and we want to benefit the community. We want to provide opportunities for, for tourism, if possible, and um, improve the quality of life for the local residents. Um, and then also we want to make sure that we're also working with partners uh, and close coordination with those partners to where we're, we're matching our overlapping, overlapping goals. So with that, these are the draft goals that we have been uh, working from uh, since the, the scoping meetings uh, to try and develop our objectives and uh, strategies around those. Um, these may change slightly during this portion of the planning process to be tweaked to make sure that everything flows together and works uh, appropriately. Um, so the four broad goals being wildlife and their habitat, the cultural resources aspect, um, as well as the wildlife dependent recreation and partnerships is going to be key for us uh, in the future to get things done on refuges and provide opportunities. So, and this is to just give you an idea of where we are now in the process on the planning wheel. Um, where the red hour is back and forth, we're in the process of developing and analyzing the draft alternatives and preparing the, the chapters for the draft document and we'll be hoping to release the draft document sometime in the winter of 2014 with a final plan coming out hopefully in the spring of 2015. And so, so the, public, the public comments were made in 2012? Yes. yes. So with that, that concludes my presentation. If, uh, I'd like to open it up if anybody has any questions uh, that I might be able to help clarify what was in the presentation. Okay. I do have a question. Uh, sure. One of the approved uses is for observation of wildlife. Okay. Do you plan on putting observation sites for bird watchers and that kind of thing there? That I'm having a hard time hearing you, sir. I'm sorry. One of the uh, planned uses, uh, approved uses, is for bird watching. Is this turned on? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you planning on putting the observation sites for the public to be able to go into the marsh for ob observing birds and that kind of thing? Well, those are some of the things that we're evaluating at this point in time. Are there opportunities to do that within the refuge boundaries? Can we do it? Uh, what are the limiting factors for that? Um, if it's, you know, is it access from the beach? Is it access from the, uh, uh, the, the mainland side? Um, where we might have to obtain access across private lands. Um, you know, uh, is it safe for those types of opportunities to be out there? Um, you know, that's one of the reasons where we've been working very closely with the Corps of Engineers uh, during their planning process as well to see if, uh, if we can reasonably uh, offer those types of opportunities at Plum Tree Island. Back to the, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but is it, you got, is that every, your, okay. back here on your, uh, one of your early slides, you were talking about the layout of the, of the uh, thing, and Bob, I don't know if you can put that up for everybody at home, but you were basically talking about the, the property that Fish and Wildlife owns, and then the 2,119 acres, I think it was, I was yeah, that's the, of, uh, of the other marshlands, mm -hmm. and I guess uh, as we, Proceed, you know, proceed forward and kind of for the Army Corps too, you know, uh, that, that's a nice property line, uh, but, you know, is there any risk uh, inside of those private, private properties? And on the fish and wildlife side of that property line, are there, is the woods there, but it, they all appear to be privately owned? I've been looking at so, the old, what we refer to as um, oh geez what's the name of that thing um, this Black ridge Walnut. Black Walnut Ridge so that's private property I'm I'm looking at your map there but it, it yeah, appears to be those are that, that portion of the map that's uh, has the stripe lines through it mm -hmm. that's within the refuge acquisition boundary but we don't currently own that well, okay have the goal of owning that. That was uh, done back in 1993. There was a boundary expansion to try and protect those additional acres. And land acquisition is based upon appropriations approved by Congress. So what does that mean to those, these owners? Uh, 
if if there are opportunities that exist and it fits within the priorities of the refuge, there may be opportunities where we would protect those areas. Now, again, some of the other things that come into play as we're evaluating lands for acquisition in the future, you know, uh, uh, climate change and sea level rise is an important one. And that's the reason I brought this. This is kind of the foundation of the question because one of the things that you talked about was that if, if the sea level rise predictions are true, then the wildlife refuge is gone. That's possible, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And basically then, as, as we start to talk about remediation, then you're starting about, uh, for the Army Corps thing, if uh, we need to, it's easier to at least get this unexploded ordinance out now than it will be once it's underwater. Otherwise, we're, we're basic, basically, uh, you know, we can post all the signs that you, that you want, but it would, it would be territorial water. And that, that's why I'm, I'm sort of asking the question, and maybe I'm bouncing around too much, but if your wildlife refuge is predicted to be gone in a century, do you want the, the uplands? And, and, what's, could... and what's the, uh, you know, the Fish and Wildlife's view on that? Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things that we're looking at at this point in time um, with evaluation of things that, you know, we uh, are looking to find out more information on the resources that exist there, mm -hmm. um, what the risk would be to them. You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions that we're having to assess and evaluate, and it, it won't necessarily all be completed by the time we have a final comprehensive plan in place. There may be research that needs to be done to gather that information beyond that scale to see what the future target areas, so to speak, for us would be for protection. Would your comprehensive plan, like our, we have a comprehensive plan for the city, would your mm -hmm. comprehensive plan basically say our long-term goal is to acquire, to not acquire, to, you know, would you expect that to be in your, in your comprehensive plan? It's a uh, long-range plan. Yeah, it is a long-range plan, and, and those would be things that we would have to evaluate as time went on. Um, as, as we see, you know, these are based on models, mm -hmm. and they're the best projections that we have at this point in time. We have to, we have to plan for those uh, to occur that way. Does that mean, you know, do we do research to try and say, well, maybe there's something we can do to help with accretion? Mm -hmm. uh, or protection of what still exists or what is currently existing so it doesn't go away. Um, the, 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 like, if I'm, uh, hopefully that's clear. Um, if it's not, please let me know. Yeah, creep, you're talking about the title like, creep that we're getting Are there right projects now? that maybe we could work on where it would protect and preserve the existing area? Maybe, uh, but we don't know that yet. Um, you know, that's part of the exploratory nature that we have to do with some uh, some of the aspects of Plum Tree Island National Wildlife Refuge to figure out what may be the right direction to go. And then we also have adaptive management too, uh, which as we're managing a certain way, if we find out new information during the 15 years of implementation, it may tell us that, well, we need to start, you know, looking at managing a little bit differently based on the, uh, the activities that are happening out on the, on the island. Okay. All right. How aggressively would you go after that proposed area then strike? Uh, like I said, uh, at this point in time, you know, we're having to evaluate things like sea level rise. You know, we also have to be responsible when we acquire lands as well. Um, uh, if, if we find that, uh, you know, say some of those lands are going to be underwater in the next 25 years, would it be a best use of uh, taxpayers' dollars that are appropriated by Congress to acquire those lands if it's, if it's short, relatively short-lived? Does Fish and Wildlife have condemnation power? We have that power, I believe, but we don't use that. Fish and Wildlife Service has a policy that we only purchase lands from willing sellers. And it's been that way for quite a few years. Am I reading the map correctly? The 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 one where um, it's predicting actually 
predicting seed level rise. Is it is predicting that most of the stuff that's in the yet to be acquired area will be brackish marsh. All that correct. Orange? That's what it's predicting. Okay. It's hard. There's no streets on there for me to follow. Right. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. Uh, you kind of show in an initial of the salt marsh is at 2,100 acres at this point in time estimated. And by 2100, there would only be about approximately 187 acres left. Right. Oh, I know where my house is. Right, but, but on this one, it's hard to read the two meter sea level rise scenario without streets. What is the current status of the uh, efforts by the Corps of Engineers to, first of all, identify potential uh, unexploded munitions, and then secondly, to do something about it? Are you with where they stand Here. on that area. I, I've got a little presentation that I, I will show that will explain that. Okay. As soon as we're done. With I, think, I think we're done. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. George Follett with the Army Corps of Engineers out of Baltimore. Um, I'm a bomb tech by trade. I did it in the Navy for 20 years. Um, I worked as a contractor when I retired from the Navy and I didn't really like or I didn't understand the process that I was seeing out in the field. So I said, hmm, maybe I'll go work for government and I can make, make a difference. So I went to the work for the government and I found out that as an ordinance and explosive safety specialist, I really had, I had no power to do anything. I was uh, doing what I was told to do. So then I realized the folks making the decisions was the project managers. Uh, ultimately, it's the, certainly the people with the money in the Congress. but. The project managers are, you know, they make the difference. So I've been doing that for, I guess, close to 10 years now for the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, one of the first projects I inherited from uh, the guy I kind of replaced was the Plum Tree Island uh, Range. And, and I, I guess I probably, 2006, 2007 is when I uh, got the Plum Tree Island thing and um, had some, you know, there was a lot of uh, national media attention, as I'm sure that uh, most of you are probably aware. There was a series of articles written that talked about the hazards out there. And uh, what I'm going to tell you today is there are definitely hazards out there. You know, we've definitely found that. Uh, we have a process that we have to follow. And uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, it's not a fast process, but it's the best process that we know how. We want to make sure that uh, whatever we do, we do correctly. And when we you know, say that we've, we've done our job, and, and we, we're never going to walk away from the site, but when we say that we've done everything we can, we want to make sure we've done the best job possible. And that's kind of why it's been taking us a lot longer than what we thought, because there's a, there's a lot of issues out there. I mean, just the, the hardest issue is just getting out there, you know, and then you got the weather issues. Uh, we used boats to get out there, and uh, there were some days they couldn't even get to the island to do any work. So, I mean, that's, that's all restrictions. And, of course, it's salt marsh, so it's hard to get around out there. Um, but I won't get too far ahead of my presentation. I just wanted to introduce uh, Rich, Rich Braun here real quick. You want to just introduce yourself, Rich? Rich? You want to introduce yourself? There's a yes. speaker right there. My name is Richard Braun, and I'm a human health and ecological risk assessor with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I work on sites that have, been con that have contaminated soil and groundwater and help to determine the potential human health risks and the potential ecological risks for the materials that have been left in place. And if it needs to be re removed, I help with the process of determining and planning that. Okay, so let me uh, get right into it. We initially started, we had a uh, contractor that was doing uh, the field work for us, and that was Sean Environmental. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, we could only write contracts for five years, and their contract expired last year, so it kind of really put a, a crimp in everything, and we had to kind of stop, and there really wasn't any funding available to, to bring them back, but uh, it looks like we're going to be able to, uh, to bring them back on board, uh, hopefully in the next couple, three months, as soon as we get the funding uh, from Congress, which has been very slow this year. And, oh, by the way, Shaw was bought out by another company, and they're now, they're now known as uh, CBI. I'm not sure what that stands for, but uh, when you hear folks from CBI coming in to talk, you know, with me or whatever, those are the same contractors. It's just they're just helping us get through this process, and I'm hoping that we will get that contract done uh, this summer sometime. 
so the project team, you know, it's not just the Army Corps of Engineers. It's uh, certainly the city of Pocosin folks. Uh, EPA has been a member of Virginia DEQ. The property owners, of course, are an integral part. The, uh, the stakeholders and um, certainly the geographical district in Norfolk, uh, even though we out of Baltimore do all the military munitions work, but they're the geographic uh, district. So they have certainly something, some, you know, part to play. Just a kind of a area that outlines the area that we're looking at. Um, I believe this also had, this is also the, um, the danger zone that's been posted. Well, that's actually not, the outer perimeter would be the danger zone that we think that uh, people should stay out of uh, for now until we can get in there, get in there and do some work. Um, I won't go into the site history too much, but uh, from 1917 to 1959, you know, there was stuff dropped and shot out there, rockets, whatnot, and uh, for that time period in the United States uh, arsenal, about 5% of what was fired or dropped or whatever didn't go off. And that's because the U.S. uses two safeties on all their ordnance items. That way we can take them safely from the magazines, put them on the airplanes, the tanks, whatever, and use them how they're supposed to be used. Well, sometimes those safeties don't, don't let loose, or they only let loose partway. And that's why we have uh, the problem out there, because you know, of all the stuff that was dropped, we figured probably 5% is probably still out there. Um, so the Corps of Engineer process started in 1992. Um, the inventory project report basically said, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a property that we need to look at. It's uh, authorized for, uh, for further work. So we did a uh, archive search report. Basically, they look at all the records that are the National Archives that are germane, that they can find that are germane to Plum Tree Island, which, which was done. Uh, there was also a photographic analysis done by um, TEC or TAC. I can't remember what they stand for. They're, they're an Army Corps of Engineers outfit that... Uh, analyzes historical photos and I believe you guys got a copy of that yes we did okay and that's quite interesting so now the next step was a site inspection so we actually did send some folks out there and it's not a very in-depth they kind of look uh, it's a little more than an archive search report but it's certainly not determining uh, nature and extent but they they go out there is there evidence of ordinance yes there is okay so they were done now it's time to go on to the next step so the next step is really where we are now and that's the remedial investigation. And we, we basically go out and see, we, we take a pretty good look. We do uh, walks through uh, the impact areas, uh, the, the non-impact areas, and we try to determine the nature and the extent of the problem, that's, or what's left out there, I, I want to say a problem. Not only of the ordinance, but is there any issues with uh, chemicals? Is there any issues with uh, metals? that were part of the ordinance at one time or just any activities that the federal government uh, did out there, you know, what do we leave behind and what do we have to address? Uh, the good news is um, that report is pretty well finalized and I'm hoping to have it printed uh, next, next month, within the next month or two. And you will get our administrative record for this uh, project is at the library here. So we will make sure there's two copies There'll be uh, hard copies, plus there will be uh, DVDs or CDs, whatever works out. So you will have those. And, and you did, or your, your office did have a chance to look at the RI report back when we, <laughs> we thought we had it almost done back in 2011, and we did get some comments, and that was all incorporated. Um, I do want to point out that uh, the remedial investigation in that report is um, it's not available to the general public until we're done with it. Okay. Um, the next step is the feasibility study after we finish the remedial investigation. Now, the good news is the feasibility study is, is pretty well done uh, as far as uh, we look at what can we do, you know, what, what's the uses out there that uh, could, be, could be done. And a lot of that is, you know, what we get from the Fish and Wildlife plus uh, the other, uh, like Virginia DQ, you know, the kind of stuff that they want to see done out there. So that's really what we're doing now is we're, we're basically evaluating uh, what could be done out there and more importantly what would it cost to do the cleanup or whatever to enable that, those activities to happen that is also um, I, I believe you guys have seen that as well and commented on that and that was kind of completed in uh, 2012 um, we and I'll get into what what happened why we kind of had a stumbling block 
uh, let me before I talk about this um, <laughs> for one thing we're restricted in time frames to go out there because uh, there's different nesting periods and whatnot um, and so I, I want to say our uh, time frames for being out there was like October to March does that sound right we could have access out there which is probably the worst weather to be out there so you know even uh, seasonally we, we had some issues getting out there uh, we did our uh, nature and extent uh, we, we sampled we dug we dug down to different ordinance items to see what was there we got rid of some stuff and then we took a lot of uh, a lot of samples um, soil samples whatnot to see was was there were there any of what we call munitions constituents issues out there um, and it, initially it looked like there might be elevated levels of copper what else rich uh, copper was the final one before that there was questions about parts of the munitions constituents luckily there were no explosives detected so that was off the list of things we're concerned with initially it was co uh, cadmium copper lead selenium and zinc and for the ecological risk assessment, we did a three-phase approach. We did a screening level ecological risk assessment. Then, based on the contaminants that were left at that stage, we went to a baseline ecological risk assessment. And then finally, there was copper left, and we were concerned about that. So it was decided that more samples would be collected from the from the natural ponds of shrimp and crabs and th those samples were collected by a, a group of four people two from the Corps of Engineers one of which was an unexploded ordinance effort, uh, expert the other was a person who would be able to collect the samples plus two people from the US Fish and Wildlife one was a person who went out and actually picked the, the uh, natural ponds where the shrimp and crabs would be collected and the other was another um, person who could go out and collect uh, crabs and shrimp. What was nice is we went, the samples were collected in September, they were preserved and sent to a lab who analyzed them and it turned out that the amount of sh copper in both the shrimp and crabs from the background ponds were exactly the same as the amount of copper in the shrimp and crabs collected in the bomb craters, which at this stage shows that there's no detectable impact on the shrimp and crabs in the bomb craters, and that th those shrimp and crabs from the bomb craters would not cause an impact, an adverse impact to wildlife, specifically fish, I mean birds who would eat from fish. the ponds, fish, shrimp, and crabs. So that allowed us to come up with a decision that further action is not necessary. There's no potential for adverse impact for the wildlife at those bomb craters. And let me just tell you in layman's terms what what happened out there um, whenever we go out we do we take samples uh, not only do we take samples on the property itself we take samples on a nearby location that we know is not affected the same way that uh, Plumtree Island was and that's where we get our background samples uh, early on it was uh, identified that uh, a fish called a mama chug if I'm saying that right uh, when they when they find their little home they pretty much stay in that little home so if anything was going to be affected, it would be the mama chucks. So that was what we tried to go out and take our, our samples from originally. Well, when they went out there, mama chucks weren't there. <laughs> so they said, well, there's some crab and shrimp. Let's take those instead. Okay, and turns out we never took crab and shrimp background samples. So it was like, ah, okay, so we got to go back and take crab and shrimp background samples. And all this was taking a lot of time. And when it was finally decided that we would go do this, it was like February. And oh, by the way, you can't take those samples until these creatures reach their adult stages, which is going to be like next September, October. So we just kept losing time. But the good news was when we finally were able to get out there and take these new samples, the background samples, 
there was, it turns out there's no issue. Um, there is no issue uh, with munitions constituents with metals any different on Plumtree Island than there is on the rest of the, the area around here that we could tell from where we took the samples. Uh, I did send you a handout that talked about some of the samples that, that were taken. Uh, it's not in here, but it was a, a paper I sent to Vicki, and there is a, one of the little blocks talks about uh, that there's a MC issues with copper and whatever, but uh, that, that's all going to be struck, struck from the uh, report. So when you get that, you'll see that. But if you do notice that, if you pick that up on that little table, that uh, is incorrect. So if, if, if I understand what y'all just told us, <clears throat> please correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Because I'm, I'm that layman you were talking about. But um, it sounds to me like your environmental assessment for, for constituents, uh, heavy metals, uh, and all of that stuff is a good positive report for that Plum Tree Island is basically... Uh, not an environmental threat to surrounding waters, to the migratory birds or anything like that. That's, That's true. correct. I'm, what I'm uh, now, I, I guess you you'd led into your conversation that there are is still issues out there. Ordinance. Ordinance. Right. So we are we are truly at the point where we can retire the one environmental risk, and we're surely talking about ordinance risk. That, that's correct. And in the uh, the the RI report and the feasibility study is going to state that no further action uh, for MC, for munitions constituents, is going to be addressed from this point forward because we did not find any issues out there. Okay. Now, that's not to say that, you know, five years down the road, ten years down the road, you know, we find an area that's got some really discolored water, or, you know, indicators that there might be some issues. Well, at that point, we, we would regroup and we would probably take samples and find out what the issues were if it looked like it was uh, related to uh, federal government okay. activities out there. So the, uh, and I'll get into a timeline here a little bit. After we do the feasibility study, then we go into what we call the proposed plan. The proposed plan, and this is just from the federal government standpoint as far as munitions, you know, what we do is we look at what we, what we studied in the feasibility study, and then we talk to all the stakeholders, you guys, we talk to property owners, we talk to the Virginia DQ, and we say, okay, what's, what, what's the best use of this property out there? And I, and I do want to point out that they, drew, they did drop up the 2,000-pound bombs out there on, on the impact areas. A 2,000-pound bomb has about 1,000 pounds of explosives in it. If you were to detonate, and that's the only way we could do it is to detonate them in place, if you were to detonate a bomb out there in that environment, uh, I can tell you from my experience, uh, that amount of explosives is probably going to leave a crater, I don't know, probably 30 feet across and probably 30 feet deep to start. That, and, and that's just talking about right there where the bomb goes off. Then there's a blast wave that goes out, and that pretty much 1,000-pound bomb is going gonna, is gonna to kill anything within probably 300 feet of where that bomb goes. Just the, the blast wave is going to take it out. And I'm talking birds, you know, that kind of stuff. Probably not grasses and whatnot, but it, it'll do a lot of damage. So one of the things that we're looking long and hard at in the proposed plan, and, and we've discussed this right from the beginning, is we want to make sure that whatever the plan is, you know, whatever the cure is, it doesn't do more damage that that ecology out there than than we can than we want to see happen. So, um, I what we're probably looking at is we probably would not do any detonations or very few detonations on the interior, and the property owners have told us flat out that you know they really don't want that kind of destruction out there uh, within the uh, within the refuge. So anyway, we do this proposed plan. Uh, everybody in the stakeholder team gets to take a look at it, make their comments, and then we go through a 30-day review period. Uh, we advertise in local papers. We make that proposed plan, the draft, available here at the administrative record location, and then the public has 30 days to come in and look at that and uh, give us their comments. Uh, during that 30-day review period, we would also set up a public meeting or a public information um, meeting, whatever whatever we think is appropriate, and I would be there, uh, Andy would be there, uh, we'd, we'd have folks from Virginia DQ, and the public would be invited to come in. We'd have posters and whatnot showing, you know, different types of information of what we have, and then that's the, that's the chance for the public to say, you know, this is what we want to see happen out there, or this is not what we want to see happen out there, and we would address that. Uh, that, would, that would become a permanent part of the proposed plan, and that once we went to, to print, Certainly, we would have to respond to all the questions and comments, and that would all be, be final, part of that final proposed plan. So then we get to what we call the decision document. The decision document says, okay, here's the proposed plan. 
here's the recommended uh, pass forward out there, what we're going to do, and this is what we think the costs are going to be, okay? And just off the top of my head, and don't, don't quote me on this, but we're talking in, in the multi-millions of dollars of whatever we do out there. And, I, and I'll show you some of the things that we are thinking about doing out there. But uh, it's going to be very costly to do any cleanup out there on the perimeter and the waterways, whatever. So, I mean, let's say it's 30, 40, 50 million dollars, whatever, whatever it turns out to be. Well, that, that decision document has to go up to a certain level in uh, Department of Defense for signature. And, and they basically say, okay. All right, you know, we'll we'll buy off on that. You know, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that within the next twenty years that the federal government sets aside uh, fifty million dollars to do this work in Plum Tree Island. So I'm throwing these years out at you because I, I want you to understand that this is not a fast process. Okay, it's not the, the decision document's gonna look fifteen, twenty years, that's what it'll look like. And and then even if we have a signed decision document, and then it's up to the Congress to give us the money to do the work, okay? Uh, the good news is um, I was asked this year if, if we could spend any money at Plumtree because they ha just happened to have some, some extra money, and uh, can you guys use 15 to $20 million at Plumtree Island this year? I was like, well, no, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, my hope is that next year we'll have the decision document signed, and uh, best case scenario, maybe we'll get funding next year and we can, we can start to do some work out there. Uh, worst case scenario, and what probably is going to happen, it probably won't happen next year. Uh, this is something that's probably going to take a while. Okay. I, I really can't give you a definite timeline. I can tell you I'm involved with uh, a property up in uh, Pennsylvania called, called Toby Hanna. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It was an old bombing range. It was, uh, it was about 23,000 acres, of which um, 7,000 acres have a, uh, had or have a, an ordinance problem. And we did the whole process out there. We had a decision document signed. The decision document authorized up to $72 million for the cleanup. But that was over a 25-year period. And, of course, there's escalated cost over time. Well, <clears throat> that was signed in 2010. 2011, they said, hey, we got some money. So they gave us, um, they gave us about $17.5 million. And uh, we thought we could get everything done for that amount of money because we were getting it done so fast. And uh, we'll, we'll finish the lion's share of that work this year. But during the course of doing the work out there, we figured we found that, that uh, there's another 1,444 acres that we didn't know about before that we found doing this remediation. But now it's going to cost another $16 million to, uh, to do that additional cleanup. Well, guess what? They said to me, George, we've got like $45 million to spend. Can you use any of that money at Toby Hanna? I was like, yeah. I said, okay, how much do you need? So they're going to give me $16 million. <laughs> we'll be able to get that contract written this year and finish it up. So on the one hand, I'm telling you, it may take quite a while to get there at Plum Tree Island to do what we, what we want to do, what we, what we have to do. And on the other hand, it, it may turn around and happen real fast for us. So it's, you know, it's kind of a guessing game at this point. How long uh, does an ordinance out in the weather, in the water or under the ground, last it's been like 55 years since there was any weapons dropped there we did a project in baltimore harbor uh, deepening and widening some anchorages uh, we found 1300 ordinance items civil war or? uh, earlier than civil war we found a cannonball that dated back to the 1500s um, the oldest live item we found was a uh, it was a 15-inch, what they call a mortar, even though it looks like a cannonball, and that was one of the first mortars that were fired during the War of 1812 when uh, the British came over. It was a British uh, round, and that still good to go. Still had powder in it, still had a fuse. You know, it's the kind of fuse that you light, and it's got like a little, like a cork and then a piece of paper that goes through, and that paper's got powder on it, and they cut that paper to a certain length for how long they think they want it to burn. So, yeah, the, the, yeah, the answer is... That Long stuff out fact. there is, okay. is still going to be alive. And, and not only that, but what we found, the items that we did find that were, say, buried in the mud, it was a very, if I'm saying this right, anabolic uh, environment. And there was, I mean, some of the stuff we took out of there looked pretty pristine. I mean, it was in very good shape. Now, the stuff that's in the water, in the salt water, of course, that's going to erode a lot faster. But the stuff that's on the interior that's, you know, maybe down several feet, I, I think that stuff's going to be there for a long time. So. Let me... Uh Try and the Plum Tree Island is huge. Right. Okay. And by you know, and let me kind of take you back to one of the reasons that we're here is to talk about 
um, public access and, and those sorts of things. Obviously, Plum Tree Island is a salt marsh. Just the same problems that you're talking about, access, they're all the reasons that people really don't want to, to, to go out there. So I think a lot of the things that you say about um, leaving ordinance, especially those in real salt marsh areas, is, is just fine. How do you all prioritize? If you get the 17 million, you know, this is a, uh, basically hypothetical sure. at best. How do you prioritize how you're going to go? How do you, how do you all marry up the, your ability to clear versus your ability to, to gain access? In other words, do they know what you're looking for? You talked about in your presentation, Andy, that you have a hard time getting out there uh, to do your work. Um, so how do you all define to them where you want to gain access and those sorts of things? Because when I look at this map, the, one of the things that, that Andy, you and I have been talking about is the beaches. And, you know, and I, I'm skipping ahead several slides on you. I'm sorry. Right. But these beaches appear to be in, in uh, areas that, you know, you may have some uh, potential to do just a beach area. And unfortunately, one of those beaches is where the tiger beetle population is, so that right. uh, that's probably the nicest beach that's out there. So that, just for that alone, you'll Population. you'll never... Pardon? What did you say? The what We part? have the northeastern beach tiger beetle that resides oh, on the beetle. beaches of that refuge um, okay. on the, on, in the southeastern portion there. And um, it's one of our trust resources that we're responsible for okay. and have to try and provide our... Uh, try and protect... And, and manage that species. Um, you know, it's all part of a, a food chain where you know, the tiger beetle utilizes the beaches. You also have uh, shorebirds and other wildlife that may be feeding on those. And do you have that on Cow Island? Do you have that on these other beaches as you circle all uh, the way around? Just the one beach, and uh, they did. There is some other populations. Um, Paradise Point or. Point? What is it? Factory Point. Factory Point. There's, a, there's another name for it Paradise so Point. Factory Point? I believe it's Factory Point, but don't quote me. That, we, that would uh, be in Hampton over here? Yeah. We did hire a, uh, a gentleman from one of the local universities who's the, evidently the foremost expert on the tiger beetle in the United States, and he went out and did a study. Uh, he wrote a nice report, and that report will be part of the RI report. Okay. Uh, so it's got locations and everything in there. So that, that will certainly it's, be explained. Because Factory Point has access, right? It has personnel access. Yeah, but that's just... The tiger beetle thing, I, that's not munitions. Uh, I understand, yeah. I understand, but I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah, so. I would have to consult with the in, uh, Ecological Services Field Office uh, to, to verify the locations of the tiger beetle. I'm only familiar with what's actually on. On, on, the, on the refuge itself, but and that's, I guess what I'm saying is, are we all sharing a common, you know, priority of, okay, it's here or it's, for all I know, your priority is way down here. I mean, um, do hey, we, Mayor, if you let me just go well, finish through a few sure. more slides, and I, I think it'll be a little clearer for you. That'd be great. But yeah. I, I do also want to make a comment that, you know, at this point in time where we're at in the planning process, we can't really share uh, the well, draft documents. And that's what I'm saying. How do you, in, in your process, marry up with the Army Corps in their process? Both of you are saying the we're same thing, that we can't make this public until we're done. Right. How do you all share your your goals and hey this is the where we're going together as the federal government you know and intertwining because they're on our core planning team okay. and with federal agencies and the state agencies that are on the core planning team it's a an equal exchange of information okay. so and it's not just information in but it's also information to them. and the information that we give to them is the information we get from our project team which you guys are part of so what will happen, the next step is when we get CBI on board, uh, back on board as the contractor, we'll come down here and have a meeting with you. And we'll talk about the feasibility study and, you know, what the stuff we're looking at. Okay. Um, you know, we can tell you what we can do out there. We can tell you what we can't do out there. But what is going to happen out there is ultimately up to the property owner, uh, what they, you know, what they'll allow to happen out there. So uh, just an example of uh, now the picture on the right, on the right there, that's an actual picture from Plum Tree with, uh, you know, one of the items that's out there. Uh, that's a hundred, it's like about a, probably a hundred pound bomb, 125 pound bomb with a spotting charge in it. Uh, we found five inch rockets out there. Uh, the bottom right is a uh, an old hedgehog uh, 
I launched off the back of a boat, I believe it was. They're 7.2 inch. This is a picture plum, plum tree that, uh, yeah, there's definitely rockets. Uh, Jado bottles in the, in the left. Uh, we pulled a bunch of these Jado bottles. They were used to help the aircraft get off the runways when they were pretty well loaded from Langley. And it's just kind of a real fast rocket burn. Uh, on the right side is a picture of a kind of a new one. That's not from Plum Tree. On the left side is, uh, and a lot of the items were identified as bombs in shallow areas turned out to be these Jado bottles. And uh, one of the first things that we wanted the contractor to do when they went out there to do their work is we wanted them to do a sweep of the perimeter. And I forget how many of these things they pulled out, but it, it was over a thousand that they, uh, you know, they actually brought, brought a barge out to take them off the island. And they're empty by the time they hit the ground. Uh, they're supposed to be empty, but if they don't fire, uh, if they misfire, you know, they don't get the right electrical charge, then uh, they're not empty. And we actually, in fact, I think we found five that uh, we were pretty sure had a uh, still had that uh, jet propulsion material in there, and, and that's actually a high explosive. Uh, you know, it burns real fast, but it, if it's it can detonate, so uh, we did make sure that those went away. You had a thousand of those. I believe it was over a thousand. It's all in the IR, RI report, so you can you can tell you can check later see if I'm lying to you. <laughs> this is a picture of a, a bomb. Actually, I took this one uh, way back when we took the tower the tower down. Mm -hmm. That was a looked like a you know what we thought was a bomb in the shallow water areas. So we were just kind of documenting before we come out and did some work. Um, okay, this is a, a very important slide, and uh, I want to explain that uh, the little black dot up in the northern end there, that's where we found a cluster of uh, World War I bombs, and I think they were like 50-pound bombs or 75-pound bombs, but they were definitely from the World War I era. Okay, so they're very, very old, and they were just in that one little tiny area. Going further south, you see the red dot there. That was uh, another area that we found a cluster of uh, munitions, and all we can figure is there must have been targets there at one point, you know, way back when. So we didn't really expect to find those, but we did find them. So, you know, we, if, you, if you find stuff in an area, that more than likely there's going to be other stuff out there, okay? So I want to show you, what I'm trying to show you here is that there's really not a whole lot of areas out there that there might not be munition items, okay? We won't know until we actually get out there and do some work. The bottom uh, on, the, on the east side there, that brown area, the kind of the darker brown area, that's, you know, that's the major cluster of uh, where, we, where we found most of our anomalies, okay? And that's, there's a lot of stuff there. And that's where if we were to do a cleanup, that would be very, very costly to go in there and do that. That's where the tower was, isn't it? Right, right. The tower was right down there as well. We also had an opportunity to bring some uh, experimental stuff at, at no cost to us to come out and do some surveys in the waterways, the local waterways, because uh, looking at that topographic survey, you know, we realized that there was quite a bit of erosion of, of the property itself over the years since it was first used. So we, we knew that there was, we even found some of the targets out in the water, you know, that were supposed to be on land. So we knew that there was going to be stuff offshore. And that's a particular problem because you don't really want to bring a, you know, a powered boat in there with a propeller uh, into an area that has bombs in it because you could potentially set something off. And that's the main reason why we have that uh, danger zone, that exclusion zone around the island, is just to keep people from getting hurt. So uh, we did we, we did do these surveys, and it's more than just there, but the kind of the yellowish area, that's kind of a high-density uh, anomalies. That's where there was a lot of stuff that probably needs to be looked at. And then the blue area is kind of what they call the buffer area, and there wasn't nearly as much there. And, and also the green areas up here, we're not sure, you know, how much is there, if anything, but we, you know, we did take a look through a lot of those areas. We didn't really find anything. Um, but one thing about a range is they were practicing, right? So when they first started, they weren't very good at it. <laughs> they always hit the target. That's why they actually put spotters out there to find out, you know, where the bombs are dropping. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Whenever we talk about a range... You see that little circle that was supposed to be the impact area. Well, that's where there was. That's where they, if they, you know, if they scored an ace, that's where it hit. But more often than not, they didn't score an ace. Uh, this is what we got from the underwater surveys. Uh, you can the all the blue marks there. That's uh, underwater anomalies, and all these uh, the sensors. All they were doing was telling us that there was metal out there. Okay, that's all they did. There was a lot of, in the, in the southeastern portion there, there was a lot of uh, high-dense anomalies, you know, a big density of anomalies out there, and that pretty much corresponds with, uh, you know, where the impact area is. So it kind of told us a lot that, yeah, you know, 
it, what's offshore pretty much mirrors what's, what's onshore. Mm -hmm. This is uh, just showing you where we took our samples from, our soil samples, to see if there was any uh, munitions constituents, and we worked very closely with the uh, Virginia DQ folks and the Fish and Wildlife folks, you know, all the areas. And plus we had uh, we, the folks from the contractors, uh, risk assessors and whatnot, plus the Corps of Engineers, you know, everybody had a, a big input as far as, you know, what's what's due diligence, how many samples should we take, what kind of samples should we take, how should we take the samples, where are they going to be located. So that this is the result of, of all that. Not showing the background samples, but it's showing you where all the samples are. And there's a lot of information in the RI report when you get a chance to look at that that discusses this in great detail. Also, uh, one of the things the topographic study did is it kind of focused in on where the craters were or what they thought were craters. And uh, that's this blue, this purple area is kind of outlining uh, areas that were identified as, as craters. Now, what we found, and also it, it also exists in the Blackwater, Blackwater Refuge over on the eastern shore, mm -hmm. is that there are little pond-like, circular pond-like areas that look just like craters. And guess what? They're not craters. So all the areas that were identified in that topographic area as being craters due to bombing are not entirely accurate. Uh, how do you tell the difference? I, I don't know. But uh, we did take a lot of samples from craters, you know, just to see what was there. And amazingly enough, there really wasn't much there, even the ones, I mean, there were, uh, of any of them. Uh, we did find some elevated copper and some of the uh, crab and shrimp, but as it turns out, it's, we don't think it's related to federal uh, government activities because off the island, we found pretty much the same thing and even higher, higher concentrations uh, of copper and, uh, I wouldn't say arsenic, and uh, there was some other metal that uh, showed up. So. And I guess that's just a factor of uh, how, uh, how they make their living, right? I have a so, question. Oh, yes. Sorry, real quick. When you were making the measurements of, um, I think this is the underwater, whatever, the people that helped you on this one, how far west did you go? Did you, I see that... It, I don't know what the boundary was where you were looking. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I think they... Um, Did you start at Messick Point by any chance and go east? They went or? a lot further out than, than what we suspected was a problem. I mean, they definitely went way on beyond. And that report is part of the RI report. Okay. So that, that report, there was actually two different, uh, two different uh, types of studies were done, and, and both those reports are part of the RI report. So uh, it'll explain everything in there, it'll tell you how wide the space, the lanes were that they, they dragged the things through. I think there's even uh, some photos, because they had a camera mounted on the sensor, so there's even some uh, photos of, uh, you know, what things that they kind of saw as they were going along. They would uh, snap pictures if they, th if they thought they saw something that was worth looking at. So, Mayor, um, to get back to your question about what's our priority, well, certainly our priority is going to be based on what the path forward is out there as far as what the proposed plan comes up with. Um, and this is all um, draft right now. It's nothing's, mm -hmm. nothing's final, but uh, we have discussed doing uh, clearances in the shallow waters around the island because I think, in my mind, that's probably one of the things that we really need to do first because we want to make it safe for people to go out there and, and even start their studies out there. Um, some of the things we've talked about that would go into the uh, proposed plan is we would go out there and uh, mark lanes that are clear for the fish and wildlife folks to go out there and, and do their studies of the uh, local um, flora and fauna. So we would, you know, go out there, what we call avoidance, and, you know, if we find a bomb or whatever, what we think is a bomb underground, we would mark that as an area to stay away from. And this is all, all be done with GPS tracks and whatnot. So now the fish and wildlife folks could go out there in the future and, and they could go out there and do these studies. And, of course, we, gotta, we have to find a good place for them to land, land their boats to, to get onto the island. So that, that's one of the first things we want to do is to uh, clear at least the outer perimeter, you know, where the beaches are, where they want to get in. And, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we come up with, but I think there's, uh, we, may, we may wind up doing the, the entire perimeter around the, uh, you know, where we think there's, there are stuff. I and mean, we did do a surface clearance, and we took everything out that, you know, looked like it was uh, hazardous. That's what we did when we first got out there, but we know that there is some stuff underground that uh, that would be the next step as we go out there and, and find out what they are. Uh, another thing that we've talked about is putting in uh, elevated walkways. Uh, once we had safe landing areas and Fish and Wildlife was uh, basically did all their studies they wanted to, they, we 
talked about, and once again, this is only draft as we would uh, go out there and uh, I'm not sure who would pay for it yet, but you know, put in an elevated walkway on pilings and, and uh, with pictures of the birds and probably even places for people to sit down and you know to be able to use their binoculars and look. Um, yeah, we're just exploring opportunities and ideas that may that we may be able to offer opportunities for the public to engage in out at the refuge. Excellent. But, but once again, you'll never clear it. Don't we'll plan on this happening next year because it's not going to happen next year. I mean, we're talking even if we were to get $15 million or $20 million next year, uh, just to plan to do this work is probably going to take six months a year just to get started and then we have to work from the outside in. So, you know, the first thing we'd want to do is those uh, probably the beaches and you know, we're, we're restricted by getting out there time-wise. We can only go out there from September to March or October to March. That really narrows our window as when we can be out there. And then, you know, weather plays a big factor. You know, there's maybe two or three days in a, in a week that you can't even get out there because the, the seas are too rough. Or there's something coming in and we don't want the folks to be stranded out there because there's no facilities out there if our workers go out there and they're, and they're stuck. So we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we take care of all those things. Okay. All right, anything else, uh, Council? I guess uh, thank you all, uh, really, for, for briefing us, for briefing the community, because they'll see this. This will we'll, we'll constantly run on a, on a repeat session. So I guess, Andy, uh, anything else that you want to add? When's the, when do you foresee the public comment period? I think you put your dates up there just to reemphasize it's uh, We're winter. We're to have a draft out by sometime this fall. Okay. Um, and, and that kind of mirrors what you were talking about yes, with yours. Yes, and we have been working with them with that intent that it doesn't make sense to have two separate processes going on if we can dovetail them, which we're doing. Right. And if you look at my, my schedule, oh, I guess he took it down, but uh, I think probably the last slide is showing my projected schedule, and that certainly um, mirrors what they have. And when I said we're going to have a 30-day uh, public review and a, and a public in meeting or information, whatever, I mean, that's something that we want to do uh, in coordination with Fish and Wildlife because that would be the same time that they would be doing their, their comprehensive uh, plan. So okay. we want to do them both together. And I think that uh, we would probably answer a lot more questions That would be great. between the two of them at that time. That would be great. And that uh, gives the citizens something to look forward to. So I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you I, for the opportunity. Yes, sir. I have one question for you. Um, sure. if, if when we get to this public meeting, how big of a turnout do we think there would be and what would be the best venue to have that, that meeting at? It's well, something to think about. Okay. We will, uh, we will actually work with you okay. and uh, set up... You know, if, if it's agreeable to y'all, we'll set up a venue of the of the right size based on the feedback that we get of, you know, public really wanting to hear. I think you're going to see a lot of the property owners nearby that uh, want to come. Uh, we certainly have the facilities to accommodate a uh, large crowd or small crowd, you know, and uh, we'll, we will help you do that. When we did the kickoff for the RI back in 2008, I think it was, we did it at the, uh, down by the... Uh, <clears throat> the boat landing. Yeah, there was, a, there mm -hmm. was a club there, and yeah. right. Uh, That's about fifty people at that. Meeting. Yeah, it was a good turnout, but I'm thinking that you know, with more. all the all the latest interest, I think you're probably going to see more people than that even. And uh, and we certainly want them all to hear, especially if they border it or they own land adjacent to it, you know. But uh, that we will help you facilitate that. As soon as y'all are ready to do that, we will we will kick in because we consider ourselves to be partners with it as well. Uh, not only yeah. are you the partners, but you're like the leaders. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Appreciate y'all's time. Appreciate you coming down from Baltimore. And Andy, we always appreciate your time. So thanks. thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Rich. There are two of these cards.